So good evening, everyone. Good to see everybody in the house, as well as those of you that may be joining us online. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. Again, just by way of uh, reminder, I uh, just want to let everybody know that we've been doing a little Q&A series that's commenced uh, when we uh, all experienced the shutdown. We've kind of carried through through that thing uh, because of some of the great questions that we're getting online. We will continue this uh, probably through the summer and then come um, early September, we'll uh, restart our uh, minor profit study, our minor profit series. So there's about three or four questions that are already in the queue after we finish up tonight. So I wanna make sure that I honor people's uh, questions uh, in this Q&A series. So glad everybody could join us. Again, I wanna uh, welcome you to uh, Ascent Bible Church located here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. My name is John Romero, um, the lead pastor here in Ascent. Um, again, just, uh, just wanna welcome each and every one of you. Um, that said, I uh, want to just uh, remind you that uh, there's a process that we put in place so that we could uh, so that we could kind of harvest, for lack of a better term, your questions. You can send them to Bible study at ascentbible.church, or you can text me directly on my cell phone at 505. 6702986. Real quick before we get started, is it a little warm in here? Is everybody a little warm? Larry, can you lower the thermostat just a tad? Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm a little warm. So, again, uh, there's a couple ways you can get us questions, and that's to uh, via email or directly on my cell phone. And let me just say that the questions have been awesome. Uh, really impressed with some of the the feedback also that we're getting. And speaking of feedback, um, as we go through this process, those of you that are in the room, I think you guys know what to do. Just raise up your hand. This is a very informal kind of unstructured setting. So if I say something that um, uh, may, not be, um, may not be quite understood by whatever it is that might have been said, uh, just, uh, just raise up your hand and maybe just follow up with the question. Uh, the only thing that I would ask, if we could kind of stay on topic a little bit, that way we're not on too many rabbit trails, because those of you that know me well, you know that I have a tendency of, of going off on tangents, so just to kind of keep me, <clears throat> keep me between the lines a little bit, uh, just ask that we do that. But again, if you've got a question that is outside, outside of the topic in a huge way, uh, just... Uh, just text it to me or email it to me. We may, we'll make sure that it gets answered. And those of you that are online, and it's been awesome uh, to reconnect with a lot of friends and, and relatives. Uh, man, my, my nephew Angelo in Hawaii, who's in the Marines, has been logging on at times. A really good friend that we discipled years and years ago in Kansas City, that Jeff and Nancy Metcalf, their daughter Amanda. Uh, some other folks. The McCormick's all the way in Virginia once in a while. I don't know if the McCormick's are on. But anyway, uh, it's been awesome to be able to just see each other live. And uh, if you've got questions, you I think you guys know the drill. Just uh, type it in. Uh, Larry's sitting over here on her Surface, uh, on her little machine, and uh, she can relay it back to me. <clears throat> but uh, again, just want to welcome everybody. I think everybody... Uh, kind of knows uh, what this is about. So let's get right into this, uh, have a word of prayer, and um, we'll get into this question that has literally taken us <laughs> three weeks to answer, and I'll explain why that's the case in a minute. So let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we come together tonight again just thanking you and, and Lord praising you for the opportunity to come together in your word, and, and uh, Lord, allow your spirit to reveal to us um, all that he asked for us in terms of who you are. Most importantly, Lord, as we get to know you and, Lord, experience you, I'm just so grateful for that as we um, open up your word and, Lord, hear from you so that you could reveal to us your plan, your purpose, and, Lord, where it is as believers, where it is that we fit into this, this grand scheme, this incredible plan that you have put together in your word. Thank you for everybody here tonight. I want to just, again, um, 
Lord, express my appreciation for the faithfulness and for the questions that are being asked that are so pertinent and so uh, incredibly applicable, especially with, <clears throat> with all that we're seeing and all that we're experiencing in the world today. Thank you for your word who reveals to us so much, uh, so much about what's going on. And Lord, we ask that of you tonight, that um, as we consider um, the last part, part three of this question, um, that you would just open our hearts, enlighten us, reveal to us, Lord, exactly who and what we need to know about this incredible event that we know in your word as the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. Be with us, Lord, and we'll thank you, we'll praise you, and uh, give you all the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, hey, Sylvia or Arlene, can I ask you a favor? Can you remind me at the very end of Bible study to just share a couple of announcements? Some people that are dealing with some, some um, ailments and stuff, okay? So, just as by way of reminder. All right, so here we are, Bible study. And uh, this is the question that was posed um, a couple of weeks ago. I've got June 6th up here. Today's the 17th. So, is that two weeks ago? I believe it is, right? Yeah, exactly two weeks ago. <coughs> It's a question that was asked by, by Kathy Pino, and I don't know if Kathy's on. Probably not. She's one of the folks that I wanted to mention at the end of Bible study tonight. Just for those of you that may not know, her mother passed away yesterday. So um, they're kind of dealing with that right now. And just, again, ask that you keep the family, <clears throat> our, especially her and Patricia, her sister, in your prayers as they begin to move forward in um, putting together a service for their mom. So... Um, uh, Kathy's question is this, uh, and it was a question that came about because I think uh, a few weeks ago we were talking about uh, a very significant event that we find in the Bible known as the tribulation period. And again, I've got a little diagram in here that we'll expound on a little bit just by way of review and reminder. But uh, her question was, what are we going to be doing, those of us that believe in the rapture, and a pre-trib rapture at that, pre-tribulation rapture, uh, what are we going to be doing in heaven uh, while all this stuff is going on on the planet, was her question, essentially. And then she had a follow-up question in her email, and it's this, are we going to be able to witness or to even see what's taking place on the planet? So what I did as I considered her question, as a matter of fact, <laughs> Typically, when I, somebody emails me or sends me a question or asks me over the phone um, a certain question, I tend to right away process. And, and as I considered the scope of the question, it, there was no way that we were going to be able to answer it all in one week on June 6th. So what I did was I identified the three heavenly events that will be taking place during the tribulation so after the rapture of the church happens and her questions what will we be doing what will be we what will we be witnessing while all the events are happening on planet earth and those of you that do have the book of revelation um outline or diagram from last year when we did that study uh you can go ahead and pull it out now because i'm going to share with you a couple things out of that whole thing uh, but there, uh, there's a little red box, or they sh there should be a red box on what I'm referring to in the diagram. Let me just show you real quick where it is. Um, this is our Book of Revelation diagram, but this is the seven-year period that we have been studying and talking about extensively since the since the whole pandemic thing. Uh, but in this red box, because we didn't have room to really squeeze it in up here somewhere, because this is the heavenly stuff are the three events that will be taking place during this seven-year tribulation period uh, that will be happening on earth. And there's the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, the second one that we looked at last week is the seven-sealed book, right? And um, <laughs> these are them in a list. And then tonight we're going to be looking at the third and a very significant event known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. So those are the three events that you will find listed on this particular slide uh, that you find in the little red box. Um, right after the rapture, um, I made it very clear that, and you see this in uh, the book of Revelation, here's your text, your proof text. 
in Revelation chapter 4, every one of us will stand before the Lord in what is known as the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for what we did with our lives after he saved us. This has nothing to do with a, although it's called a judgment, it has nothing to do with um, with uh, whether or not or the, the whole salvation thing. For a believer, your soul or your sin was judged at the cross, if you remember that. So now that you are saved, you and I have this responsibility of living a life for his glory. So that becomes the issue and this question. So the 78.3 years that you're given on this planet and <coughs> this life that you are given, um, you're either going to live it for him or you're not as a believer. So what you will give an account for, and you see that both in 1 Corinthians 3, the, the gold, silver, precious stones, the rewards that are, that are received, not for your own glory, not so that you can have a trophy case in heaven someday, but so that you can cast those crowns, those rewards, at the feet of Jesus. Hence the, the, the Christian group known as Casting Crowns. They get their name from Revelation chapter 4 where the believer will ultimately cast those rewards at the feet of Jesus as we honor and glorify him for the privilege of number one, saving our soul and bringing us to this place of purpose and fulfillment in this life. Um, so it's a very significant event a major event that I don't want us as believers to ever lose sight of. And if you remember, I also shared with you in that study, and if you're not sure what was said, you can go back and listen to it because it's online. Another significant purpose for that judgment seat of Christ is that is the event where he corporately, where Jesus corporately purifies and makes his bride holy. Now, who's his bride? We're going to talk about that tonight as we consider the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, so now you're seeing some of the dots being connected. The other significant event that we talked about last week is this second one, which we call the book with the seven seals. And we took the time and took you back to the Old Testament, to the book of Leviticus and the book of Jeremiah to reveal the importance and that significance of that book because you can pick up Bible commentaries on Revelation, on Revelation chapter 5 specifically, and you'll hear different, uh, different notions or concepts about what that book is. Uh, I've heard it mentioned that it's the Bible, that it's the Lamb's Book of Life, um, that it's uh, a different variety of books. Um, this book holds a unique purpose, and again, if we apply the principles of Bible study, especially principles 7, and eight, which reveal to us, which reveal to us um, um, how the Bible interprets itself by comparing Scripture with Scripture. It's pretty clear that this book is some kind of a title deed, a deed for the planet, for the planet Earth. Because at the end of the day, if you remember that book, known as the book, it's only referred to as the book, has seven seals on it. And it's going to be Jesus who is going to break each one of those seals, uh, which will bring about a certain uh, plague or issue or famine on this planet. And those seven seals are found in the book of Revelation chapter 6 as those events begin to play out on earth. So it plays a, it's a, it's a really key chapter. It's a significant chapter because it's in this chapter that you see the launching of this uh, major event that we know in the Bible as the book of uh, as the book as the tribulation period. Let me show you in uh, chapter number six, which obviously, if you look at um, where this chapter sits, an interesting uh, thought that is uh, consistent with um, Kathy Pino's second question. Look at Revelation chapter six. I want to share with this because. This will, answer, this will answer the second part of her question, which was this, if you remember. Um, will we be able to witness some of the things that will be playing out on planet Earth 
as those seals, as those seven seals began to be opened by the Lord. Uh, but look with me here in chapter number six. Um, this is right after the the book is is revealed and the seven seals are being uh, being opened. It says this in uh, chapter six in verse one. Remember this from last week. I think we we close we close with this. But this is Jesus, and what we're reading is still a heavenly perspective before he begins to focus on planet Earth. That says this in verse one. And I saw. This is John now witnessing all this, the guy that wrote the book of Revelation. And I saw when the lamp opened one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of, tr of thunder and one of the four beasts saying, what's, what did that one of the four beasts say? Come and see. Come and, see. and look at verse two. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And in verse number two is where you find um, where you find the Antichrist being introduced on planet Earth. The white horse rider in the text is the coming false king and the false kingdom that you see clearly laid out. Look at this chart again. It's being clearly laid out in the first half of the tribulation period. This is why we're calling this the false kingdom of Antichrist. Seal number one, the white horse rider. And after that white horse for three and a half years, man, all this hunky-dory singing, everybody's going to be singing Kubaya, peace on earth. There's going to be a one world religion, a one world government. The no new world order is going to be all put in place and everything's going to be hunky-dory, man. Until that guy does what he does as Jesus describes it in Matthew chapter number 24 verse number 15 and he desecrates the temple known in the Bible as the abomination of desolation and when that happens those Jewish people that have embraced him as Messiah and the entire world who have embraced him as this messianic great leader are going to realize how and who he is and that's when he turns on them. And that's where we begin to experience to coin a phrase that Jesus used. That's when you get into what is known as the Great Tribulation. And it's during the Great Tribulation that the heart of the book of Revelation or what the book of Revelation is about. So to answer her question, we're being invited over to come and see. And we'll be seeing a lot of these events happening and playing out. Now as the whole trip thing is playing out for these seven years, keep in mind that you and I are not bound to time at this in, at this point. Why? Because you're at a whole other dimension. You're literally in what the Bible describes as the third heaven. I don't know if you know that about the Word of God, but there are three heavens in Scripture. They're mentioned for the first time in the book of Genesis chapter 2 and then they're described in detail in Psalms 148. The Bible describes the first heaven as this area that we see known as our atmosphere. So where the birds fly and where the clouds exist, the Bible defines and describes, the psalmist writes, is the first heaven. The second heaven in scripture are the cosmos. When you look out at the night sky, and man, we have some of the coolest night skies where we live, don't we? So when you're looking into the night sky, you're actually looking at what is known as the second heaven. I don't know if you know this or realize this or not, but there's a veil. It's called the sea or the crystal sea. There's a veil that separates the second heaven, outer space or the cosmos, from what the Bible describes as the third heaven. And it's in the third heaven where God dwells. It's the third heaven where Jesus resurrected to on the third day when he came out of the tomb. He didn't just come out and stay on earth and then and then walk around and reveal himself. No, he made his way all the way to the third heaven. If you remember that story in the Gospel of John chapter number 20 when he comes out of the tomb, the ladies are ready to embrace him. The women that were there waiting for him because we know what's so cool about women. They're believers, man. They had this strong heart and they knew that when he Jesus told them 
that he would be that he would be resurrecting they were waiting at the tomb for him to resurrect begs the question where were the disciples <laughs> right the 12 guys that he had that he had taught that he had invested in that he had revealed all this stuff to him they bailed man but these women were sitting there waiting for Jesus and when he comes out they were ready to just they were just ready to bear hug him and love on him and he says Wait a minute, touch me not. Why? Why? Because I have not yet ascended to my Father. And that evening, as he makes his way back after that resurrection, the truth, the depth of the resurrection, he's allowing Thomas and the disciples to touch him physically. So I see there's a question coming up, I assume, Larry? Yes. Okay. Uh, Justin Marion, what happens if we're not raptured? Who? Just uh, oh JD okay, um, what that's a great question, and uh, uh, the question is JD is asking what happens if we are not raptured. Here's what I will say, and this is what tonight is about. If you out there or anybody in this room have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you will be raptured. No if ands or buts. The rapture is not based on whether or not you believe in a rapture or the rapture or when the rapture occurs. That's a truth. That's a reality. We believe and we teach and you're going to see why tonight to some degree in a pre-tribulation rapture. And it's the pre-trib rapture because God has a specific a unique place for only two groups of people that we'll again bring up and talk about tonight. So if you miss the rapture, then you will go through the tribulation period. And I don't know if you can see this or not, or if you can read it on this chart, but those of you that do have the, uh, the revelation chart with you, the means of salvation, which is on the very bottom of the sheet, is really key because what we have done in the last few weeks as we've considered the, this question and we've been laying out these three major events, the book of Revelation has a very unique and a very profound structure to it. And it divides perfectly into three parts. And the three parts are divided by two significant events. And those two significant events are revealed to us in Revelation chapter 4, verse number 1. And Revelation 19, verse 11, and that's where heaven opens. Heaven opens twice in the book of Revelation. And when, Re when you see those two events happen, it divides the book in those three distinct parts, J.D. So Revelation 4, 1 happens, and I saw heaven open, John says, and he's raptured up. And that changes everything, and that's where these three heavenly events that we have been talking about these last two weeks are going to take place. And guess who's raptured out? Everybody to the left of this, of this line. What does that consist of? That's church history. That's the church age. You see that very clearly laid out in chapters 2 and 3. What is, what is the church or, or what is church history? Again, keep in mind... The principles of Bible study. This is why those principles that are in this little booklet are really key. If you remember that principle number two, which helps us determine context, right? If you look at principle number two, there's three very distinct groups of people that the Bible is written to. Three and only three. The Jews, right? That's Israel. And to, to expound on J.D.'s question... This whole tribulation period is their judgment. It's God's way of not just bringing judgment to the planet because he wants to destroy the world, but it's to restore and bring Israel back from their falling away. This is why you're seeing the Jews of the diaspora, the Jews that were expelled in 70 AD coming back to Israel like never before. We were in Israel in 2018 and everywhere you went, remember that trip? Mm -hmm. But everywhere you went in that country, there were those uh, sky, sky cranes. Why? They can't build enough housing for the Jews that are returning. 
And you know what you see going on in this country? And you're in it, and then mark my words, it's, it's playing out. I just read an article today where movie stars are embracing the teachings of Louis Farrakhan, one of the most devout anti-Semites on the planet. Movie stars are embracing some of his beliefs or whatever. That said, you know what's going to happen in this country? Anti-Semitism. You're going to see American Jews migrating to Israel like never before. So imagine the rapture happen and the Jews, American Jews going back to the land like never before. Those two people groups that the Bible's written to, right? The Jews and the Gentiles and then the church. <coughs> who are the Gentiles? Anybody who is not Jewish. That said, what does the church consist of? You know what the church is made up of? Anybody, Jew or Gentile, that accepts Jesus Christ as Savior. That, that makes you part of the body of Christ and a really profound term that is given to the body of Christ is it's Jesus' bride the bride of Christ hence the what? <coughs> the marriage supper of the Lamb the marriage supper are you seeing the dots? so while he's marrying his bride Jesus the church that we're going to be talking about tonight Israel will go through this seven year tribulation period and you know how do you know it's Jewish? Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Jeremiah explicitly refers to these seven years as Jacob's trouble. In Daniel chapter 9, known as Daniel's 70th week, he mentions God's city, Jerusalem, and my people. Who were Dave Daniel's people? Israel. And he talks about that seven-year period committed or dedicated specifically to Israel prophetically. But the church in God's plan... And this is what we're going to talk about tonight. The church, that, which has a bunch of metaphors. She's called, she's called, a, she's called a bride. She's called a, a family. She's called the body of Christ. But to me, the most profound and the most significant title or metaphor that she could be given prophetically is that she's Jesus' bride. It's His bride. And that's what we can't lose sight of. And anybody who accepts Christ, this is how you come to Christ in the church age. How do you know we're still in the church age? Who can tell me? that? that we're, why are we still in this church age? Go ahead, Arlene. We're here. You're here. For God's sakes, you're still here. And the fact that you're here, and those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ through grace, through faith in Jesus Christ alone, become part of the church. It has nothing to do with religion or religions or any of that other stuff. Simply a belief in your heart, confess in your mouth, Lord Jesus. Paul says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, and thou shalt be what? You'll be saved. Well, that's a different salvation than what's going to play out. How did that happen? Um, this is going to be a different salvation that's going to play out in the tribulation period. You know what the means of salvation is in the tribulation period? You know what it's going to be? You endure the end and you refuse the mark. This is stuff that we were talking about last year when we were doing this study and here it is raising its ugly head as we began to witness some of the systems that are being put in place for that to happen so JD I don't know if that completely answers your question but I'll tell you what we'll do is we'll do a little bit of follow up and, and talk about the uh, explicit event called or referred to as the rapture Okay, Larry, is there a follow-up or what's going on? Um, another question. Okay. Um, Steve Romero, does heaven open up a third time in Revelation 11 12? Not explicitly like this, uh, but um, it does open up when the two witnesses that he's referring to are raptured up. And he's talking about Moses and Elijah who show up in the chapter. But no, not opened up where a major event is playing out. So, are we, are, we, are we good? So this is where we're at. And again, if I didn't clearly ask the question, we can always follow up. And there's a whole, there's an entire Bible study that we could dedicate to just the event of the rapture and its, its imminence and... And, and I, I think when I did this study last year, 
which would have been sometime in probably March or April because it's chapter number four. Um, I think that probably um, I spent, I remember, I remember clearly, I don't remember all the things, but I laid out seven or eight specific things that reveal to us the not just the doctrine of imminence everybody know what that means that it could happen any instant at any instant at any minute uh, who was i was talking to somebody today how would we respond as believers if we if we explicitly knew if we knew that if, if, if jesus came in and it, we have it in his word don't get me wrong but if jesus walked in the door and he says and he stood up here and said all right I'm going to come back in the rapture on Sunday, on Sunday the 21st, on Father's Day. How would we respond? Think about that for a second. How would we respond? What would we? What would tomorrow be like for us? Do you ever stop and think about that? Well, here's the truth. Here's the reality about the doctrine of imminence. It could happen Sunday. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen right now. It's about one of the last verses, one of the verses that we're going to look at tonight in Revelation chapter 19, verse number 7, is, or will we be found ready? Are you ready? That's the issue. That's the dilemma. Or where are we and what are we doing as believers? Because it's so easy for us to get caught up in all that's going on in this world. And let it suck us in and let us draw us in. And I'm just as guilty as the next guy when it comes to wanting to know why things are the way they are. And I'm not denying and I'm not discouraging you for knowing because the Bible challenges us to know, right? That we are to be like the, the children of Ishakar who had an understanding of the times so that we could tell Israel what to do. And you should have an understanding of the times. But man, if we start to dwell and focus on all the craziness that's going on in this country and in this world, you know what you know will happen? We'll lose sight of our focus, our mission. What's our mission? To see people come to Christ and to disciple them. That's why you're here. So there is that balance. And this is why Paul says to this is why Paul says what he says to Timothy, this young man that he discipled. Take your Bibles and Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 2 real quick. I want you to, I want to read three or four verses. I hope JD is still on because there's a, there's a couple of verses here that I want you to consider JD being in the military because that's what it's like being a believer is God likens this to, to combat, to battling, right? We know about Ephesians 6 and spiritual warfare, I shared with you, I don't know what Sunday, a couple Sundays ago as we were beginning to, to dive into the book of Joshua and this character Joshua and the significance of, of who he is and his character. Man, he's a warrior. And we need to think like that. We need to be like that. It says this in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Listen closely to the words because they're so profound. It says in verse number one, Thou therefore, Timothy says, or Paul writing to Timothy, Thou therefore, look what he calls him, my son. He says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, do you are going to need God's grace and his strength to get through this life. Mind you, this is the last letter that Paul writes before he goes to be with Christ. And he's writing it to a young man that he loved, that he invested in, that he refers to over and over as his son, as his spiritual son. I think I mentioned verse number seven of chapter one last Sunday. He knew that with Paul being out of his life, that he would be dealing with some uncertainty, probably some anxiety. And he says to him, Timothy, don't forget that God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power. What's power, Marvin? It's the spirit of God. Don't forget that you have God's spirit living inside you, but of power and of love and a what? Sound and a sound mind. Guaranteed this young man was struggling with some uncertainty and some anxiety. And he's thinking, man, my, my mentor's going to die. My mentor's gone. And man, what am I to do? Well, you know what? You study the Bible. This young man, Timothy, becomes the first pastor at Ephesus. So when we read about the letter to the Ephesians, he became the pastor of a, of a church there. 
the church that launched the church age. Man, God's good. And he writes these words to him in chapter 2, Timothy, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And he says this, here's discipleship. You want to know what your mission is, church? People out there. He says, all right, Timothy, the things that you've heard of me, commit to faithful men and women who shall, who, and what's going to be their role, who shall be able to what? Teach, Teach others you. also. There's discipleship. So we have a ministry in our church called discipleship. You know what we do in that ministry? We teach people the Bible. We just teach you the Bible. We teach you about the doctrine of salvation and eternal security and, and what does the Bible say? It was really cool because I met with, I'm meeting with, I'm discipling Phil Griego and we were discipling the other day and he had some questions about, about baptism and it was really cool because he was coming from a, from a religious traditional perspective of baptism and when we laid it out biblically he goes, wow. It makes so much sense now. So this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to reveal truth and bring perspective and light to people's lives as we teach them God's word. And then look what he says to him in verse number three. Why are we to do this? Look at verse number three. He says, Thou therefore, Timothy, endure a hardness as a what? Good as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Right there, man, we're called out that you, this is more than just being a good little Christian that shows up to church on Sunday. No, man, we're battling for souls. We're battling for the souls and the hearts, the minds and hearts. They teach that in, in uh, military academies. You're, when you're dealing with a civilian population, you're dealing with hearts and minds. To be a good soldier of who? Of Jesus Christ. And then look what he says in verse 4. This is really awesome. Talk about perspective. For no man that warreth. How many of you believe that you're in war? Well, here's, a ch here's our challenge. Here's our charge. For no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Did you catch that? Paul just said, you better keep your news stuff and all the stuff that you focus on in perspective because man it could tangle you up really quick how do I know that I'm as guilty as the next believer out there it's so easy because everything that I need to read is on my little phone and all of a sudden man I'm finding myself Marvin know this Marvin sitting right here who's in the medical field and I, we, we were having a staff meeting and, and my wife already, this happened about two months ago when all the stuff started, the pandemic stuff started to happen. And I got entangled. This happened, I'm, I'm as guilty as the next guy. I got all entangled with all this stuff, man. I where and why, da, 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 da. Where, what are the Jesuits doing now to the world and all this stuff. And all of a sudden I'm waking up two weeks into this whole experience and I said to Larry one morning, I said, I think I'm getting vertigo. I had never experienced vertigo. I didn't know what it was. I just knew that you're off balance a little bit. You guys that know me already know I'm off balance anyway. But I was really off balance. And came to the meeting and I kind of shared with Marvin what was going on. Marvin's a nurse. He goes, you know what, dude? You need to get your blood pressure checked. Bingo, man. That's exactly what it was. It was like level two before a heart attack. <laughs> I wasn't feeling anxious or fearful or anything. You know what I was? I was just inundated with noise, with craziness, with things. Right. And it affects, I don't know what you know about the mind, but it's powerful. And the subliminal mind, think of an iceberg. The conscious mind is just the little tip of the iceberg, man. What, the deepness of who you are and what, you, and what affects you emotionally and even physically ultimately is below the surface. And all this stuff was hitting my subconscious mind, man. And all of a sudden, I'm dizzy. And I didn't, I didn't, I had never had blood pressure issues. Where did that come from? What was going on in my mind? What I was allowing into my mind? Yeah. I, I can't honestly say that I experienced fear or anxiety. 
But you know what I did do? I entangled myself with the affairs of this life. And I wasn't reading like I would have because I was reading news. I wasn't listening to the word of God in the evening like I would normally do. I always turn on my Alexander Scorby, go through the Bible book, and before you know it, I'm asleep. I was finding myself waking up at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning looking at news releases and news stuff. Me. Paul says, you better know this war is spiritual. And man, Satan will do anything and everything to get my eyes off the mission, won't he? Very effective. So, this is the book of Revelation. And uh, again, I just want to drive home the fact that these two events are the keys to structuring or to revealing to us the structure of this book. Revelation for one, heaven opens, somebody goes up, that is the church. Why? Because it precedes the rapture, tribulation period, and then the second event is the second coming of Christ. And we'll talk briefly about that tonight, but that is the, uh, the uh, main event from Jesus' perspective. This is what the world has been, um, what the world will scoff about his return, but what he promised and what he will do, which will ultimately, upon his second return, establish a kingdom on this planet for how long? For a thousand years. Millennium, millennium, a thousand years. And how do people come to Christ? Obedience to the law and sacrifices. You're back to Leviticus and Deuteronomy. It's a very Jewish dispensation. Now, where are we during this period? Because we're not really talking about that in this part of Kathy Pino's question. Anybody remind me what you'll be doing during this thousand year period? You'll be what? You'll be ruling and reigning with Jesus. Remember when... Paul said in Romans 8 about being a joint heir with Christ. This is where that happens. You're given two functions. Priest. You're given king and priest. You're given a role or responsibility of a king. In other words, you're going to reign. And I don't know where and what that means exactly. I don't think all of us are going to be hanging out in Jerusalem. Uh, I hope I end up in a place like... Uh, I wouldn't mind Cuba after it's all fixed and ready to go. Or the Caribbean, or who knows where we're going to end up. You might be a king of a little island that didn't get caught up in all this craziness. I don't know. But you know what else you'll be? A priest. If you know anything about the priesthood, their role was to minister. We'll be ministering for those thousand years. So I know that's a little bit off topic, but uh, that's the millennium. So tonight, we're talking again about this third and final event of the three events that show up in um, these three heavenly events known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. As you guys look at this chart, what do you see that is distinct from between this event and the previous two? Anybody know? It's an obvious thing if you look at, look at it closely. <laughs> Anybody see? Anybody? Anybody have a thought? Go ahead. Anybody? Yeah. Look at the time span between. Oh, it's not up here. Um, no, that's the wrong. That's the wrong one. Sorry, wrong slide. This one. This one. This is the one I want to show. You. These are the three events. My bad. I am so sorry. Ask so sorry. The question to begin I'll ask the question. What is the difference between the first two events that we covered the last two weeks and this last one? The one gap, five. right? They're the one gap. Right after the other. And then yeah, because chapters 6 through 19, or actually 18, the focus is planet Earth. There's a, some crazy stuff that happens in chapter 12 where the, the red dragon presents himself from the second heaven, uh, which gets really bizarre and crazy. This is uh, where the red dragon, the, 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 I call it the satanic trinity, shows up. The dragon, 
the Antichrist and the false prophet. And in chapter 13 is where you find the mark of the beast. So that said, there's a huge gap between chapters 4 and 5, which are these heavenly events, and the last event, which happens where? Chapter 19. Because from chapter 6 to 18, or even the first part of 19, actually the first three verses of chapter 19, the focus is planet Earth. So flip over to chapter 19, and we're going to read the text, the passage, and uh, you're going to see the actual phrase marriage supper of the lamb and then we're gonna lay out some really cool stuff about why and what this thing is about and its significance in all of the bible um is everybody there revelation chapter 19 um i'll read the first couple verses just so you could see <clears throat> where and how things pick up but it says uh in verse number one and after these things i um after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power under the Lord our God. So there's some, some heavenly stuff that are playing out because again, we're witnessing and we're observing all this stuff. And it begs the question, why are we going to be alleluia and praising him in this, in this verse, in this passage? Look at verse 2. Look how crazy and weird it gets. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again, they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. You know what they're praising? The fact that false religion is no more. You look at chapter 17 and 18. Man, the Bible is very explicit, very clear about the lie that has been perpetrated to the planet in the name of religion for the last 2,000 years. Actually, not even 2,000 years, the last 6,000 years. If you go back to Genesis chapter 10, where this false religion began. And if you guys are curious about what this whole thing is about, go back and read our, go back and get on our YouTube channel and look at our Revelation study on these two chapters chapters 17 and 18 and it's pretty clear and pretty obvious who the word of God is referring to and that whole one world religion is no more man the one true religion is there so who's praising and who's worshiping us and you know why we're going to be so grateful and praising and thanking God because there's no more deception there's no, no more deceiving people that we love that we care for in the name of religion Verse 4, it says, And the four and twenty elders and the four and beasts, they fell down and they worshipped God and sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. There it is, man. Because in the very next chapter, you see his kingdom come. And how, how and when does his kingdom come? Again, looking at our timeline, it's happening all, this is all Revelation, this is all Revelation 19 stuff right here. So the kingdom is finally here. And People are praising God and, and grateful for that whole thing. Now look with me in verse number 7. and This is where you see this marriage thing happen. It says in verse number 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Verse 8, and to hear her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the time, I'm sorry, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. How and when was she made righteous? Why was she able to put on this white linen? Somebody remind me from some earlier discussion, even tonight. 
the judgment seat of Christ. That's where things were purified. That's why that event has to happen first. Now, us, in spite of all our all the stuff that the church got involved with, including the Laodicean church, the lukewarm church, the blind church, the church that is poor, blind, miserable, and wretched, even she's restored and she's purified. Look at verse number, number nine. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship, and he said unto me, See thou do not do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and my brethren that have the testimony of Jesus worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And there it is, folks. There's the event. Now here's crazy. Here's what's crazy. Look at verse eleven. What does verse eleven say? Yeah. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Now the real king shows up, not the false king that we read about in Revelation 6. Guess who's, why, guess who's on this white horse? Jesus. This is us. This is Jesus and you. Because right after the marriage supper of the Lamb, God's going to say to us, Jesus is going to say, All right, there are the stables. Go find your horse. And as Kristen is making a beeline to that stable, I'm going to be right behind her because I know she's going to know what kind of horse to pick. So I'm going to get some old mare. I'll get stuck with a Shetland pony probably or a donkey. We won't care. We won't care because we're coming back with him. You're coming back. We are coming back with him. All those minor prophets wrote about this event. They saw this event. They didn't see this stuff. Why? Why is the church so unique and so special? Because she's a mystery. That's why in a wedding ceremony, when that bride, back in the day anyway, they don't do it so much anymore, she used to wear a what? She would wear a veil. She was unique. And she's very special in God's plan. There's no other time like it in all of God's history. When we look at this timeline, when we consider this timeline right here, and I'm, those of you that are online probably can't see it because it's washed out. When you consider God's plan through the ages, beginning with Adam and Eve to the very end, there's been no period like this one where Jews and Gentiles by simply believing in their heart and confessing with their mouth the Lord Jesus became part of this amazing incredible entity that we know today as the church which the Bible refers to as what? as a bride the bride of Christ this is how and why and you see it both in in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you know that she's not going to go through the trip. Why? Because she holds a special place in the heart and in the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his bride. It's his bride. And the people that make up the church are the people that will be kings and priests <clears throat> but corporately he's waiting and coming for his breath so this is our outline for tonight as we get through some thoughts about this whole thing because this thing didn't happen just spur of the moment as God had John reveal to us all this book of revelation stuff but it really began as God's infinite purpose and his infinite plan and I'm going to share with you some thoughts tonight um, about the bride about the whole marriage supper and why this event is so significant as it relates specifically to you and to me because those of you that know him as your personal savior you are part of this brideship you are part of the bride of Christ and that's what you can't lose sight of and wait till the very end as we talk about this event here. But I want to just run a couple of thoughts by you first. 
the first thing is I want to take you back to Genesis and show you where this model began, if you will, for a lack of a better term. It began when God created Adam and Eve, the first husband and the first wife in Scripture. And then we're going to delve into the book of Ephesians a little bit, and I'll show you the spiritual implications of the bride today in what is still known as the church age. How, we know, how do we know that Paul's talking about her today? Because it's in the letter to the Ephesians, which is a letter to a church. And then there's the prophetic implications, which we're going to look at when we took a look at the Lamb's marriage. So the Lamb's experiment, the Lamb's experience, where she actually came about, and how we know her today. And then we'll talk about prophetically. So if you look at what we're going to talk about, now you are seeing, look at your, uh, your booklet, and look at your principles of Bible study. We're going to look at the first four principles of... Bible study, right? Again, I'm going to drive these things home where they become second nature to you guys. Because if you get these principles down, and again, those of you that are out there that don't have this booklet, uh, just send us an email or text us and Sylvia will get you one in the mail. But these are key to understanding how the Bible is put together. Principle number one is the principle of context. And how do you determine context? By applying the next three foundational ones. And what is it? Understand and know that the Bible is written to three groups of people. We call it the principle of peoples. The Jews, the Gentiles, and here's what we're talking about tonight. The church. Right? Principle number three. God has a plan. He's got a timeline. He's got a way that he's going to implement all these events that we have been talking about in the last several weeks and months. And then principle number four is really the one that we're going to drive home as we look at these, this outline tonight, it's the three applications of Scripture. Know this, that the Bible, when you look at it and when you study it, you have to have three different views of it. Three, imagine three sets of glasses. If you were to come into my house, you would be stepping and walking all over our house. Oh, you'll be, you'd be stepping on reading glasses. Larry buys reading glasses like she buys toilet paper. They're all over the house. So what she does, depending on what she's looking at or she's reading, she wears a different pair of glasses. The glasses that she's wearing now, I think, are so that she could see in the dark. I don't know. But you. <laughs> but what you need to do is when you look at the Bible, when you open it, the Word of God, you need to look at it from three different lenses. From a historical perspective. Know and understand that you hold in your hand a history book. That's what the whole Genesis thing is about. These are, this is a historical event. The, I, don't, I don't care what you believe or what you think about evolution. The Bible is very explicit about creation. Very clear that he created a man and a woman. And isn't it interesting that the things that are sacred to God are the very things that are being destroyed today. You know what the first thing and one of the most profound things that is sacred to God? It's life. Jesus is all about life and this world wants to destroy life. The second sacred thing to God is race. The races are sacred to him. God doesn't care about what your ethnicity is. He only cares about whether you know his whether you know him as personal savior or not. And the third thing is marriage. That's sacred to him. And Satan will do anything and everything to destroy those three. And that's exactly where he's at today, isn't it? Yes, Larry? So this question is from Tish. Okay. <laughs> Just now? <laughs> yeah. I got a text. Okay. <laughs> you want to ask it, Tish? You want to ask it, Tish? No, Tish. I have to, to decided that to be Christian. So go ahead, Larry. If if we're if if we'll all be saved, why will we be ministering at the root if we're all reigning with Jesus? You will be ministering to the people that made it through the tribulation period and that will be born during the millennium. There's still gonna be people being born in the millennium. It's gonna be a whole different <clears throat> world, but yeah. There are people are still, again, this is why we have to get back to the minor prophet study. 
because we're going to see those events happen and they'll play Christ out. If, and during that period, right? I'm sorry? They're going to want to come to Christ with all the injured. No, I, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> because because um, the Bible is very clear in the book of Zechariah chapter 14 that there will be people groups because part of what's going to happen, and again, looking back at this chart here, I don't want to rabbit trail too much, Tish. Sorry. Uh, but during the millennium, right, the means of salvation is obedience to the law and sacrifices. What does that mean? The world's going to have to come to Jerusalem for the atonement of those sins. It's, in other words, we're going back to how it was during the days of, of Solomon, David and Solomon, when the temple, the first temple existed. Except the real king is going to be present. And if you go to Zechariah 14, there's going to be people groups that are going to refuse to go. I don't know why the Bible doesn't say. Refuse to go where? To Jerusalem. Okay. During those Jewish feasts. And they will be given an account. Go look at Zechariah chapters 12, 13, and 14. And uh, at the end of the millennium, the, the uh, Satan will be loosed one final time. Because he's bound for a thousand years. He's not able to... To, to, to tempt and to do all the things that he's done in our lives. He's bound for a thousand years, but you know what you still see happening in the millennium? Man still has what? Will. Free will. You still have a choice. And there will be people that will choose not to. And if you're the king reigning over one of those people groups, you better get your little kingdom in order. That's I'm being a little facetious, but not really, right? Because it's going to happen because free will is still... Keep in mind, there's a thousand years it still happened that are going to play out of a kingdom on this earth before we head into eternity. Pastor. Yes, Michelle. During that time, the people that have endured to the end and are living during the millennial and believe in Jesus Christ, they, can still, they will have children and the children, because of their free will... Could go astray. Absolutely. Yeah. Michelle's question, so you can hear it, those of you that are online, the people that endure to the end and make it through the tribulation, but there'll be a lot of folks that endure and don't take the mark. Remember the people, and there's going to be people that will take the mark, right? Remember I talked about that in a Bible study six weeks ago in Matthew chapter number, I think it's Matthew chapter number five, where Jesus is talking about the... Uh, the constitution of the kingdom, what we know as the Sermon on the Mount, when he tells him, you know what, and during the kingdom, you're, there's going to be people that are going to what? If your arm offend, if your right hand offend you, take cut it off. Or if your right, well, you know what he was talking about? You know what he's talking about doctrinally? This really happened to us in Kansas City. We, there was this kind of a wacky dude that started coming to our church and um, he plucked out his eye. Because he was he was lusting and literally took that verse literally. If you know the Bible and how to rightly divide the word of truth, you know what Jesus is referring to? People that are going to take the mark on the forehead or in the, or in the hand. And he says, you're not going to be able to enter into the kingdom with that mark. You're going to cut it off. That's what he was referring to in in uh, Matthew chapter number 5 where if your right hand or your right eye offend you why do you talk about the right and the right hand because that's where the Bible clearly says it's going to go that mark or that chip or whatever it is Irene <clears throat> well, I have a follow up question to her okay. so during the millennial reign mm -hmm. uh, Satan is bound right yes for a thousand years yes so <coughs> Can people still accept the mark or not? No. The king's here. The king's here. The king is here. That's all. The whole mark thing is the tribulation period thing. Okay. That, right. And that has more to do with economics than anything because that's right. the whole buying and selling. And and uh, and this is why this is important. And that little chart that we, we right. provide you, the means of salvation is really key. David? Um, so after the thousand years when the devil is released again, mm -hmm. um, can he go after um, those of us who have been raptured and, or who are here? Yeah, David's question is, after the thousand year reign, 
Um, can he go after those of us that were wrapped? What do you suppose you will be during the millennium or at the end of the millennium when he is loosed that last and final time? You'll be present somewhere on the planet. You'll be present somewhere. I don't know where. Because this is going to be a worldwide thing. How do I know that? Because of Zechariah chapters 12, 13, and 14. So what, I'm, what, what will happen, he can't, he can't affect you. Why can't he affect you or me in the millennium? Because you're Christ-like. Because you have a glorified body. All you're doing is you have a very unique and a specific role and function in the millennium. And that is to rule and to reign with Christ. As a king and as a priest. You are. That's why you can't... You, that's why you can't get so caught up with the craziness that we're witnessing and seeing because you're not of this world. Your kingdom is not of this world. Your kingdom, my kingdom, is spiritual. And if we get so caught up about, about all... And you know, it's going to get crazy in this country this year as we get closer to November. And, and we get so caught up in the politics and the geopolitics and all the other stuff that people that know and they need Christ won't listen to our message because of the division that's going on in our country for whatever reason. You know what? A divisive thing that I see happening even in the church right now? The whole mask thing. It's crazy the balance that we're trying to draw. I mean, just people coming in here and me hoping and, and wanting them to be here and they're fearful because it's real to them. And how dare you? I don't see anybody in here wearing a mask. You bad people, you. But you know what? It's, it's, it can become divisive. Look at Sylvia. Is that a Kleenex or is that a... <laughs> but but you, are you seeing my point, though? It's amazing what Satan will use to divide us. Right? We're already seeing it. Life. Abortion issue. Race, man, Black Lives Matter. Look at what's going on in this country and on the world and marriage. Same sex. One of my biggest challenges right now is trying to keep marriages together, man. Is just what trying to just. Same sex marriage? What about it? We know. It's wrong. Why? Because of Genesis 2. One husband, one wife. One man, one woman. So, yes, yeah, Satan has done anything and everything. <clears throat> To complicate and to what? What is he all about? To do three things: steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he's about. There's the battle. That is the battle. So, that's our dilemma. So, what's his goal? His agenda is keep us off track. Keep us from from realizing and from accomplishing. If we're genuinely the good soldiers of Jesus Christ, is to get us off the mission, get us off our purpose. One follow up on um, um, the three and a half years when the Antichrist is actually revealed. Right here. At that juncture, so will the mark of the beast be yes. revealed as well, yes. but not before. Not that. before. But what I will say, and I'm going to echo this again. Done. You're seeing. Hold on. You're. Question. Oh, Michelle's question is. Um, Michelle's question is. Um, so it's at the, going to be at the three and a half year period where the mark will be applied, will be when implemented he revealed. when he's revealed. And how do we know that? Because the mark is mentioned within the context of, there's context again, Revelation chapter 13 and in verse 5 is where John speaks of the 42 months or the three and a half years known as the great tribulation. But here's what I will tell you. The systems are being implemented now for the, to just to just to make it an easy process, the bills, the legal, the legal, the laws are being passed, and they will be passed. Just wait, man. If we if we get a a, a, a Marxist socialist government in power, they're going to be able to do whatever it is that they want, man. They're passing they're passing bills, and oh well, we have a president that's this that's not allowing those bills to happen right now. But those bills will pass for contact tracing and everything else that we've been talking about. We'll be tracked. I'll be tracked. You'll be tracked. We're going to see exactly what happened in the former Soviet Union. Exactly.
where people were so fearful because they were concerned about their neighbor ratting on them for some reason. <coughs> it's happening. I'm going to rat you guys out for not wearing masks. I just, I, just, I, just rat, I, just, I just ratted you out because this is going on social media and yeah so if we don't have a Facebook page next week you'll know why I, I'm not holding back anymore man it's just crazy the truth is the truth I just want us I want the body of Christ to stand up like never before and see people come to Christ Amen. for gosh sakes people if we don't realize the fact and embrace the days and the day and age in which we're living in, then we're just playing church. Because if that event happens tonight or tomorrow or Sunday, then people that we love, people that we know, people that we care for will go through this period. They will miss the boat. And you see this event, this rapture event, happen in type, right? We see that in the book of Genesis, chapter number 5, that before judgment came with the flood, there was a guy by the name of Enoch, who the Bible says walked with God and was not, for God took him. And he's a powerful picture, and he's a powerful type of the believer that is removed off the planet before the judgment comes. So... Genesis chapter 2, let's talk about this experiment that you find in Scripture that is laid out for us in the very first marriage in the Bible. The very first marriage in the Bible speaks to you and to me about um, what God's plan is part of His intention. Again, if you look at page number 11 on your little booklet, the dispensational chart, you're looking at the two first ones that speak of innocence and conscience. What I'm going to read to you is exactly God's original intention, original design for marriage and its purpose and its significance because of what happened in Genesis chapter 3 and the lie that was perpetrated by none other than the devil himself, the serpent, man finds himself in a different state in what we know as original sin or this fallen state, this fallen nature that every one of us in this room inherited but can be redeemed and restored because of what Jesus did on the cross. It's called original sin. It's called the human condition. And everybody that is struggling with three things, fear, shame, and blame, you know where that came from? The fall. Genesis chapter 3. But before the fall, Genesis chapter 2, Man, God's plan was incredible. God's design was amazing. And this is what you find in the text. So I want you to keep that in mind and keep it in perspective. And this is why marriage matters. This is why marriage matters between a man and a woman because of what it pictures, of, because of its significance. And you're going to see that when we get to Ephesians 5. Because it's not about what you think or what you feel or what I feel, but it's about truth and God's authority as it reveals to its purpose. Because anything and everything that God does throughout history, and those are the first principles of Bible study, anything and everything that He does or has ever done has a purpose behind it. And when He creates that first man and that first woman, He was already creating and I use the term experiment, but it was a model, it was a type for something to come in the New Testament. Look with me here in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, you find uh, these words, and I'm not going to spend a whole heck of a lot of time in the, in the earlier verses, because in the early, in the early verses, um, you see his creation, and, and, and in verse number 7 is where you see actually Adam becoming a living soul and that came because God breathed life into him in the cool that you see life coming about when God breathed into him you know when you became alive you know when I became alive when God breathed into me his Holy Spirit right remember that Jesus is all about life 
The, the thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus is promised in that same verse in John 10, 10 is what? But I have come to give you life and a life more abundantly. So the day that you and I accepted him as, your, as personal savior is the day that he breathed life into you. You know what that's called? You know the term for that is? Breathing life? Inspiration. Inspired. This is why the word inspiration is in the Bible about the Bible. Where Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture, all the Bible is given how? By inspiration of God. It's God breathed. It's not a book written by a bunch of dudes and a bunch of men. Although they helped author it, it was God's spirit that gave them the words to document and to put down on paper. You have to believe that. If you don't believe that and embrace that about the Bible, then don't call it God's word. Because if you believe it's God's word, then you know it's God's word. And if it's God's word, then you have to embrace the fact that it's truth. And all you have to do is look at this world and how crazy and nutty and how the Bible describes all the things that we're seeing and experiencing. To me, it just validates how true His Word is. So in verse 7, you find these words of ch in chapter 2. It says in verse 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and He breathed unto him into his nostrils the breath of what? Breath. Of life. And man became a soul living. a living soul he gave him life this is where he became this full-blown god-like image with a body a soul and a spirit exactly like the triune god verse 8 and out of the ground may i'm sorry verse 8 and the Lord, the lord god planted a garden eastward in eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. Again, the Bible reminding us that God always has a place, not just a purpose, but a place that he puts us in life. And we're not going to get into all the details, but the, the actual geography is laid out in the text. He put him in what we know today as the Fertile Crescent. This was the biblical Garden of Eden, which started all the way down in southern Iraq at the Persian Gulf. And made its way all into southern Turkey and all the way down towards Egypt. That's the size of this place that he describes in the Bible. It's not just this liver, sliver that we call Israel today. It was the original Garden of Eden was massive, was huge. The very place that is being contested to this day. Why? The devil knows God's plan. He knows. Verse 10 Verse 9, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree of uh, every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And look what shows up. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two trees. And we'll get into what happens later on. But um, And then in verse 10, and the river went out of Eden. And from verse 10 all the way down to verse number 14. Uh, you find the actual boundaries of the biblical Garden of Eden. Massive piece of geography. And then verse 15 shows up. This is a key verse. This is a profound thought because in verse number 15, he gives him his charge. And here's what he tells Adam. He says, all right, dude. I don't know why I keep saying that. He didn't call him dude. He called him bro. He says, all right, bro. <laughs> and the Lord God took the man and he put him into the Garden of Eden for two reasons. To do what? To dress it and to keep it. Those are profound thoughts. Don't take that verse for granted. The word mean to dress means to be a steward of it. To take care of it. To provide. God created man to be two things in his role as a husband and a father. To provide and to what? Look at the second word. To protect. You be a provider and you be a protector. The word keep is the same word that we use when we think of a goalie or a soccer player or a soccer goalie. Someone, a goalkeeper who protects the goal. Protect it. Why would God say that you need to protect this place? God knew that this guy was going to show up. This adversary was going to show up. Just one chapter later. To deceive so God's doing these amazing things in the life of this guy and 
you see this 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 whole model playing out and you get to verse number 18 and God says something really profound, really significant. It says this, and the Lord God said, watch this. It is not good that man should what? Should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. Not a help mate. A help meet. You know what he said? We got a mission to accomplish. We got a purpose. You know what that purpose was? Besides being a provider and protector, God told him in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 27, and 8, when he summarized their creation, the creation of man, he says, I got a threefold purpose for you. Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish. In other words, you go out and you make a bunch of spiritual babies, man. <laughs> that was God's plan. That was God's intent. And it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, what's the term that we use for, what's the medical term for having babies? Uh, procreation. procreation it wasn't procreation for the sake of procreating that was never God's intent it was to listen to this word replenish I'm going to leave it at that you should stop and take that word replenish and run it through the dictionary if you want an interesting concept as to why the spirit of God uses that term why that term significant purpose everything that he does is with and so and for a purpose so you get to chapter two and now he's giving you the details of that creation and right here he says all right man you better be a provider and protector and i'm going to put somebody in your life dude i mean bro who is going to help you meet the mission <clears throat> equals that was God's design. That was God's intent. How do we know? Keep reading. And I'm going to go quickly so that we can get through the rest of our study tonight. Look at this. And so you get down to verse number... Um, let's go down to verse number 28. Or verse number... Um, let's go to verse number 19, actually 20. Let's just keep reading. What the heck? <laughs> and out of the ground of the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and... You guys are familiar with this part of the story. This is where he names them. Verse 19 and 20. Verse 21. And the Lord God. And here it is. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs. And he closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man. Made he a woman. And he brought her unto the man. So she's made of the man from his side, not from his feet so that he could be over her or from his head so that she could, so that he could be, yeah, you guys know what I mean, underneath her or, but, or, or over his head so that she could over be him, but of his side. What an incredible plan God had. And now look at verse 23 and that. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man and therefore shall a man have his leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be here's a key phrase they shall be what one flesh isn't that incredible that the God's intent God's plan that they become one isn't it interesting that he says, by the way, the dude's going to have to leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. That word cleave means to become one. It's like putting super glue or whatever between two boards. That's cleaving. And he says, dude, or bro, before, <laughs> before the guy even had parents, because they're the first human beings created, he's already telling the guy, you better be ready to leave your mama and daddy at some point, especially your mama, little boy, and cleave unto your wife. Tell me that's not truth. All you hitos out there. Yes, that's true. Right? Yes, yes. Tell me God didn't have all this thing figured out way back. He knew exactly what would happen because of the human condition. Hmm. You're not a Hito, huh, Marvin? No, I don't think so. <laughs> You're Teresa's Hito. 
Isn't it awesome how God just had everything laid out? But he says, when all this is said and done, there's just one goal, one desire, that they become one flesh. That they become one. You want to know what the biblical term for marriage is? One flesh. That's what it means to be, to be married. That's, what it, that's God's plan. That's God's intent in marriage. That you become one physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Isn't it interesting how the adversary is using sex to corrupt one of the greatest gifts God ever gave a husband and a wife? For physical, spiritual, and emotional oneness. He doesn't stop, man. Why do you find this concept laid out? You know why? Because God had this plan. Point number two. This was ultimately God's desire or God's plan or God's, God's vision for marriage. Now take your Bibles and turn them through to Ephesians 5. I'm calling this the experience because now you're seeing why the Bible is explicit about Adam and Eve, about a man and a woman because of what it represents. This is principles 11 and 12 in your booklet. The significance and the importance of words and phrases and types and typology. Isn't it interesting how the Bible, not the Bible, how the world, I think on Facebook right now, there's like 63 different genders that you could identify as. I'm not sure how that even comes about and what it all means, but you're seeing my point about how things are getting turned upside down and crazy and chaotic, where God's design was what? It's pretty obvious, right? A man and a woman, because he has a single and a very purposeful plan look with me here in the book of Ephesians and you're going to see why and by the way the word Ephesus means fully purposed God has a purpose for anything and everything that he does and now you're going to see a spiritual truth behind the the concept and the purpose for marriage Ephesians 5 I'm going to begin reading here in verse number 25. It's on the screen if you can't see it. But look with me here in verse number 25. Uh, husbands, again, we don't have time to get into the whole passage, but as you begin reading, um, you see God dealing with the husband and wife relationship in the text. He says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it. Are you getting a picture now? Of what the husband represents and what the wife represents in God's eyes spiritually. Keep in mind, this is a spiritual application to that truth that we just read in Genesis. Now look down at verse. Now look at down to verse number twenty-six. That he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word of the word, that he might present it to himself a what. A glorious church. When is that presentation going to happen? In the book of Revelation. The marriage. Yes. Everything is nothing more than, again, this is application, this is principle number four. We just saw the historical. Now we're seeing the devotional. Over here, when we get to Revelation 19, now you're seeing the doctrinal or the prophetic application. God is revealing to you and to me. In the book of Ephesians, in this letter, the purpose for marriage and what it really represents. Look at this, verse number 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. What is the significance and depth of that verse? Oneness. God already knows you dudes, you dudes out there, and how much 
I've been to the gym, man. I know how you guys look at yourselves in the mirror. <laughs> I know. I'm not deceived about the reality and the truth of this verse. And he says, love her like you love yourself. But the depth of that verse is really speaking of the oneness that should come about. How do we know that? Look at the next verse. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, 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 even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Verse 31, just a reminder for the slow class, he quotes Genesis 2. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, talking to you hitos out there, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be what? One flesh. There's the goal again. There's the purpose. Now catch 32. This is key. Ma highlight this verse. Because now he's going to drive home the purpose for marriage. Watch this. This is a great mystery. What is the mystery? But I speak concerning Christ and the church. There it is, folks. It's really that simple. It's really that basic. That the, the marriage that I have with my wife, with Larry Romero, is all about nothing more than being a picture and a type to a, to a world about this spiritual truth between Jesus Christ and his church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, which ultimately is going to lead us to the ultimate truth of what's going to play out here. So when God prepares his church to receive his church, you know what he's preparing it for? A marriage. The whole rapture thing is about a marriage. Where he brings his bride, the bride of Christ to him. This is why you and I have to embrace and have to believe in this pre-trip thing because it has nothing to do with God bringing about wrath to the most precious thing in his life, his bride. The fact that he loves her and he cares for her so much. Yeah, is she flawed? Absolutely she is. But that's the whole purpose for the judgment seat of Christ is for the purification to prepare us for that day. And this is what you see revealed to us here in the book of Revelation chapter 19. And that is the beauty of that, that passage and God using it to remind us each and every day the true purpose for marriage and what it genuinely and really represents. Now here's a really crazy thing, or here's a really, not crazy, but an awesome truth that you find in Scripture. When Jesus gathered his disciples at the Last Supper, he was revealing to them some profound truths about this event. I don't know if you know that or you realize it or not. Here's something to consider. In the Jewish faith, Jews to this day practice this every year. There are five, there's a series of scrolls known as the five scrolls or the Megiah scrolls is what they're called consists of these five scrolls, the book of Lamentations, the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Esther, the book of Ruth, and the Song of Solomon. Those are the five books that make up the five Jewish Megia scrolls. Now the book of Lamentations is always read publicly on the ninth of Av, which is a commemoration of the destruction of the first and second temples. In other words, the Jewish people are lamenting what transpired in 606 BC and then later on in 70 AD after the second temple was destroyed. The letter of, or the book of Ecclesiastes is read during the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a great book to read that brings and sheds so much wisdom about God's plan and purpose. And one of the things that I always, that I always love to preach out of Ecclesiastes for for, for funerals, for services, because they speak, that book speaks so profoundly about our origin, our purpose, or our, the meaning of life, and your destiny. 
And in Ecclesiastes is a book that is read at the Feast of Tabernacles to remind the nation of Israel of their purpose and the meaning that God has for them. And then you find the book of Esther, which is always written or read publicly in a Jewish context during the Jewish holiday of Purim, which is in the springtime, which was the period that God allowed Esther to be used to bring redemption to the captives in Persia. And then there's the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is read during the Feast of Pentecost, which was the launch of the beginning of the church age. And then at Passover, anybody know what book is read at Passover? I just gave you the list of the five books. Who took notes? The Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon. Are you getting this? Is read at Passover. Now what's the significance of the Song of Solomon? I don't know what you know about the Song of Solomon, but the Song of Solomon is known as the Song of Songs. If you go back and read 1 Kings chapter 4, the Bible says that when Solomon was king and all this great stuff was happening in the kingdom that you know he wrote some 3,000 and some Proverbs and 1,005 songs. An incredible songwriter was King Solomon. And out of the 1,005 songs, one of those songs made it into your Bible. You know what it's called? The Song of Solomon. And it's also referred to in the very first verse as the Song of Songs. So out of the thousand and five songs that Solomon wrote, man, the Song of Solomon is precious and unique because you know what the theme and what the whole Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon is? It's a love story. It's a love song between a husband and his bride. And in there you find her describing him in detail. This Gentile woman, this Gentile queen, describing Solomon. And then in chapters 4 and 7, he describes her. And that's what Jews celebrate and read every year at Passover. Now what's the significance of Passover? We know the historically what happened in Exodus 12 with Passover, but... Why Passover today? I mean, Jewish people to this day celebrate Passover. It was at Passover where Jesus gathered his disciples, right? At what we know as the Last Supper. As he was preparing to go to the cross. How do we know that? Look at John chapter 13. I'm going to camp out in a few verses here in the Gospel of John. Look with me in John chapter 13. Look at verse 1. <clears throat> now, bef now before the feast of the what? Of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. There's your context. And I don't know if you know this about the Gospel of John in the context of the Last Supper, but you find the Last Supper in chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. Those four chapters make up the entire Last Supper setting. If Jesus was following through on what traditional Jewish people do today with the Megiah scrolls he would have taken the Song of Solomon probably read it in this setting because that's when they read the Song of Solomon a love story between a husband and a wife are you tracking with me because this thing gets really interesting really fascinating now look at chapter 14 this is a continuation of Everything that he was laying out about. You guys know that the whole washing their feet in chapter 13 and just, man, just preparing these guys for a future, a profound and a significant future. And what they didn't grasp or what they didn't really understand was the depth and the beauty of what he was trying to reveal to them. 
Because he says this to them in chapter 14 in that same context. Look at verse 1. He says to them, and everybody have a red letter Bible? It, these are Jesus' words. He says, he says, let not your heart be troubled. For if you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And look what he says next. I go to what? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? I will come again. There's the promise. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also oneness. See the oneness? Verse number four. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. And then, you know, you read the rest of the chapter. Guess who shows up in great detail in the chapter. This is where he first mentions to them the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Things are going to get crazy, dudes, but you better know this, that I go to prepare a place for you. Now here's where I'm going with this whole storyline, which is so profound. In a Jewish or in the Jewish context, they embrace what is known as an engagement. In Hebrew, it's known as the katuba. That's the notion or that's the idea. And how this, the katuba works, if there's a young Jewish lad who wants the hand of a young Jewish maiden, what he does, he takes a cup with wine into the maiden's home and meets with the father and in that setting, he offers the cup to the father and to the potential bride. And if she accepts the cup, you know what she's saying to everybody in the room? I'm in on this, man. Now keep in mind, he had to come in with a dowry as well. He had to offer up some goats and some sheep. And if she was really beautiful like Larry, some camels, perhaps. <laughs> But he's offering this dowry and then this cup. And if she drinks of the cup, you know, that's why Jesus in Luke 22 in the context of the Last Supper referred, it, referred to that cup as the covenant of what? Of my blood, of oneness. And if she takes out that cup in her family and in that setting, she is now known and she has been identified in her village as the one who has been bought with the price. Isn't that awesome? And then you know what the young man does? He packs up his stuff, throws it in his backpack, and goes to his own village. And you know what he's doing in his own village? He's building a structure, a home, attached to his father's house. It was really cool because I, when I was in Cuba in January, uh, I had dinner at Pastor Everardo's house, and they did exactly that. They built a little extension to their home for Aniel and his wife, who live in a couple little rooms off to the side. But they all eat dinner together each and every day, and it was really cool. So the young man in the story or in Jewish tradition goes back and he builds this addition at his father's house. And then at some point, the father determines, all right, son, I think your house is ready. Go get your bride. And you know what the, you know what the young man does? He calls his servant because the servant has been going back and forth checking on the bride throughout this process of building this structure. And as he's checking on her, the Holy Spirit, he's giving a report back to her, right? We see that in Romans 8. You see that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse, or 1 Timothy chapter 2, where there's one mediator between God and man. Where the Holy Spirit is the mediator between us and the Lord in revealing to us his plan, his purpose, and everything. So he's checking and he's comforting. And then he goes back and he says, all right, man, I think she's ready. 
And you know what they do? They get to the top of the hill near her village. They don't enter into the village. And he pulls out his ram's horn. horn the shofar, it's called. And he blows that shofar. And he says, I'm coming. And you know what he does? He goes and gets his bride. There's the rapture. Jewish people to this day practice the ketubah. They practice the hoopah, which is the gathering of everybody. So he brings her to his father's house. They consummate the marriage. They become one. And guess what happens next? They have a party. They have a hoopah. And you know what the hoopah is? The marriage supper of the Lamb. It's the party. It's the gathering. This is what God is revealing to you and to me in his word about his plan and his purpose and, his, and the significance of the church and the body of Christ and the relationship between a husband and a wife. By the way, Danny and Michelle, congratulations on all those years together, man. You guys are a testimony, an absolute testimony of what we've been talking about tonight. Could I tell them how long? No, you tell me, Danny. Can I tell everybody how long? Go ahead. 42 years. Yay. That's rare. That's extremely rare anymore. That's a blessing. This is what happens when we embrace this incredible plan and embrace the truths that we find in Scripture and His design and how He orchestrated everything because this is what He's driving home. The significance and the power of this event. of He, he can't wait. And, and I was sharing this with somebody today, man. The marriage day is really her day, isn't it? The, the groom is usually a little bit nervous and a little bit anxious perhaps, but man, she's ready. She can't wait for that day to happen. And I don't know if you've ever been to a wedding. I know you have. Some of you have been in them, right? But have you ever just kind of stopped? Some of you, right? Have, do you ever just stop and consider the very structure of a wedding ceremony? She's outside, behind those doors. Larry went to a really cool wedding. A young man, that my son's is a really good friend, and they got married at the cathedral, and they had her outside the doors. I remember, I remember Bobby. Bobby had the closed, I mean, when Bobby was up in front with me, waiting for his bride to come to him, and when they opened those doors, here comes McKendall. Larry went to a wedding at the cathedral where she witnessed literal trumpets being played as they opened the doors and she made her way in. It's her day. Our day is the rapture. It's everything, I don't know about you, it's everything that I'm waiting for as the body of Christ, man. To see the one that died for me, to see the one that gave everything for me, and to be able to be with him eternally now, this is what this is about. This is what God is trying to drive home in His Word, that there's more to this that we just call life or whatever, the American dream or whatever is going on in the world. He's driving home the significance and the power of these truths and these pictures because of what they represent. And the most precious thing to Jesus, the most incredible thing to Him, is His bride, the church. That's what this is about. This is why at this wedding, she comes to him just like we will go to him. Where? We're going to meet him in the air, man. 1 Corinthians 4. And be together with him forever. Jack and Sylvia were sharing with me that they were watching a movie the other day. I'm, I'm going to recommend it. I haven't seen it yet, but I knew about it. It's called Before the Wrath. And I would encourage you all to look for it. I don't know if it's on Netflix or, 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 uh, or, uh, or what's that thing, that Amazon Prime or whatever. But look for that movie because the title speaks in and of itself of this event. Of the importance. I saw the trailer. That's why I think, and I'm going to encourage everybody to, 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 to watch it because it speaks of this pre-trib rapture. 
of this amazing event as God gathers his bride, brings his God bride to him to be with him for how long? Forever. How long's forever? Forever? Forever with him, man. Isn't that awesome? See, there's more to this life than just whatever you think floats your boat. God has a plan. He has a purpose for anything and everything he does, including this picture, this profound picture of a husband and a wife and what it genuinely and purposely represents in Scripture. All right? So that's the marriage supper, and that's the third of the three heavenly events that we have been considering over the last several weeks when the question was asked, what are we going to be doing during the tribulation? And we'll be witnessing or seeing what's playing out on planet Earth. Alrighty? You can't see it on that chart, but you can kind of on this one. After these events happen up here, these three heavenly events, immediately after the um, marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation chapters 19, 6 to verse 19, chapter 19, verses 6 through 10, look at verse 11. I know you guys are putting your Bibles away. You know what you see happen again? Heaven opens. And guess what event that is? Anybody have any clue? What's that event called? The second coming of Christ. Remember the homily? Christ is risen. Christ is Christ. Christ is Christ. Christ. You guys are really bad Catholics. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Well, the details of his coming are laid out in Revelation 19. And uh, man, that is a great, great study as well. If you're curious about it, you can find the study online. Again, on our, uh, <clears throat> on our YouTube channel, on our Revelation series. And the, the title of that study is Thy Kingdom Come, where he establishes his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. But there's a battle that plays out. We know it as the Battle of Armageddon uh, during the second coming. That is not actually a single battle, but a series of battles known as really as a campaign. It's a series of battles. I'm going to give you guys a word study. Go back, I'm going to challenge you. There's two places in the scriptures where God tells uh, a man, in one case Moses, the other guy Joshua, to take off their shoes because they're standing on holy ground. That is the path of the second coming of Christ. So if you want to look at that on a map, I don't know if... Uh, if uh, Phil Griego's on, he's always asking me for maps. But if you guys look at a map and you see those two places, one on the Sinai, the other one just outside, just east of the Jordan River, we're going to see that in chapter 5 of the book of Joshua in a few weeks. Great, great story. That is the campaign. That is the path that the Lord will take at the second coming of Christ. As we get into the book of Joshua, know this, that the book of Joshua prophetically is going to reveal to us that campaign of how the land will be taken by our Joshua, Jesus, at the second coming of Christ. All right? So, that was a good question by Kathy Pino. A lot of people to be praying for, folks. Um, George, uh, Larry Socia came in early for a few minutes. Let us know that George isn't feeling too good again. He's off his chemo treatments for now. Charlie Romero is also dealing with some cancer stuff. Um, write this down real quick. I want you to be praying for these folks. George, Charlie, um, Phil Griego's son-in-law got to go home yesterday, right? Is that, is that right, Marie? Um, you guys know that uh, he almost uh, was killed a couple, or last week, because he recovered fairly quick, considering that he almost died. It's been about two weeks, right, or no? Maybe, maybe two or three weeks, but anyway. State police officer who is home now. Um, also, um, who else? Charles Archuleta. Charles Archuleta. Be playing for Charles um, as uh, he's trying to uh, help his son through some stuff. So just be praying for all these folks. That's A lot of him. needs. 
Oh yeah, how could I forget Kathy Pino? Be praying for the Pino family, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning of Bible study. Kathy's the one that asked this question. Um, be praying for the Pinos. Uh, she lost her mom yesterday. So we'll be planning a service. And again, I just appreciate all of you and your faithfulness. And um, what a cool passage, huh? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for our time together tonight. Just be glorified. And Lord, we just give you thanks and praise for who you are and all that you are doing, Lord, in our lives on this planet. And Lord, in all of your creation as we see and witness your plan coming to fruition. Lord, I just pray that we stay committed and true to our purpose and our mission. Be glorified, Lord, and we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.